Hello again, everybody. Pastor James here. Great to see you in our latest installment of Discipleship 301. Remember, we're talking about fortifying the structure, the structure that uh, we started back way back in Discipleship 101 and some of those foundational doctrines about our faith, biblical doctrines um, that we talked about in Discipleship 101. We built a structure uh, upon that foundation about responsible Christian living in Discipleship 201. And now in 301, we're talking about fortifying the structure. What, it, what does it mean to really make sure that the walls are very strong on this foundation upon which we are building? So welcome back to Discipleship 301. <laughs> Now, let's do a little bit of review before we go to our next triad or a group of three things that helps explain how to fortify the structure and live the uh, way of Christ and imitate Christ in everyday practice and everyday responsible living. So we've been talking so far then in this series about uh, confusing philosophies that tempt us to get off track. In other words, there's a lot of different ideas circulating, floating out there in the world that can disrupt us from fortifying that structure and that can even tear at the walls of the structure that we build on a foundationally sound biblical faith. There's a lot of different ideas swirling around there that can tempt us to get off track. And we've talked about one of the most confusing of those philosophies. It's called speculative philosophy or speculative living. These are ideas like naturalism, that uh, we just need to uh, follow the laws of nature. Everything's just sort of planned out. There really isn't a God. There really isn't sin. Um, we just need to do the best we can with what we have. So naturalism. There's also in speculative living, this idea called idealism, that if we just remove a few hindrances on this long track uh, of history, that we will make it possible to bring in this kind of utopia, you know, this, this ideal. We can romanticize this ideal in our, in our head, and it sort of we sort of forget in idealism that we are sinful. We forget our finiteness, our finitude. We try to escape that, and that makes us very, very anxious, all right? So this is confusing, speculative philosophies that can tempt us to get off track. And so we've come at, uh, back at these speculative philosophies by saying, listen, the the Christian way that we see in the scripture, that we see revealed perfectly in the life, uh, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, is this way that does grapple with sin and our finiteness, but also with uh, the, the, the ideals that, that God has placed in our hearts. All right, so we grapple with sin, but we also see that the ideal life is not something romanticized, it is something that we see perfectly revealed by the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Christian way grapples not only with uh, our human finitude and our sin, but it also presents us the ideal in Jesus Christ. And it's an ideal that we can actually get at, not on our own, but by the help of the Holy Spirit. So all that to say, what does this all mean for us? Uh, how, what do we do with all this information, right? So we've talked about how to apply these things and fortify the structure. How do I apply the Christian way of life when all of these different speculative philosophical ideas are just bombarding us each and every day? Well, I've encouraged us to think in terms of what we're calling triads. And that's just a fancy way of saying to, to hook together three things in particular, to think kind of like a triangle, right? You hook together three things that get at the Christian ideal, responsible living, all right? And these three things not only deal with our sin, but they also help us to listen to and engage with the Holy Spirit who indwells in the hearts of the believer 
to live, to act out in certain Christ-centered, Christ-focused, and Christ-like ways. All right, so the first triad that we talked about, this was last the last session or last video we were uh, together. We think in terms of these three things, this triad, goals, duties, and virtues. Remember, And remember, a goal is like a finish line. In fact, that's the biblical word for goal is telos. So we're, it's what we're aiming at. This is our goal. And in Scripture, Christ's goal for us is to be perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect. And we've talked a little bit about what exactly that means, that uh, we can't, in our human finiteness, we're not able to achieve this pure perfection. We're never going to get there, right? It's an impossible possibility, as Reinhold Niebuhr said. We, we can see it, but we are, we're never really going to get there. But we do have a, a indwelling our hearts the, the Spirit of the Lord that pushes us forward, that leads us to the goal of being complete and mature and whole and blessed in our relationship uh, with Jesus Christ. So a goal. We also have what are called duties. And that is simply uh, that which is right. We are to do that which is right. So we have a goal, but we also have ways to get to that goal. And it's not through coercion. It's not through uh, asserting ourselves in such an aggressive sense that we just run over people, right? That's not the way Jesus did things. But we have duties. We have these right things that we see revealed in the life of Christ in the scripture to do what is right to become more and more like Jesus. And then we also have virtues uh, to round out this triangle or this triad. And a virtue is a habit. It's a disposition. Uh, it's a way that our will is disposed to, uh, adjusted. It's our attitude. It's our character. It's a way of doing life that does what is right but is also focused on the goal of walking as Jesus walked and becoming complete and perfect as the Spirit leads us uh, to do so. All right, so that's the review. Now, let's go on then to our second triad. And again, we're practicing the way of Jesus Christ. That's what these triads are all about. So let's go to triad number two. And this is it. So triad number one was goals, duties, and virtues. Here's triad number two. Today we're going to talk about sparing, appropriation, and formation. All right, this is another triad that helps us with responsible living. So if we want to look at, aim at, this goal of walking as Jesus walked and doing the right thing with a, a, a virtuous attitude, uh, responsible attitude. How do we do that? Well, let's think in terms of sparing appropriation and formation. These are very practical ways of getting at the ideal uh, Christian life, how to live and walk as Jesus walked. So let me briefly define in the simplest terms that I can what these three words mean, and then we'll break them down one by one. Uh, with a little more specificity, a little more detail. So sparing, a brief definition of what it means to spare, okay, that means to limit the self in view of others. Um, that's a fancy way of saying humility. In other words, I'm not going to put myself first. I am not going to put myself in the center of everything. This is not a self-centered way of life. I'm going to limit myself in view of others. That's sparing. More on that in just a moment. Okay, appropriation is similar to sparing, but it's a way to find common ground with others, especially with those who are different from us. We see in the New Testament time and time again, Jesus used what is called appropriation. He hung out with tax collectors and sinners, right? The the people that he shouldn't have been hanging out with. Jesus was there. Why was that? Well, he was ministering to them. Jesus said that a, a physician doesn't come just to hang out with those who aren't sick, right? He, he goes to those who need help. And uh, he was reaching out and finding common crown with other people, especially outcasts, in order to 
minister to them. And then third in this triad is something called formation. This is the recognition that we're all created uniquely. We all have unique gifts uh, and unique resources at our disposal to impact others. So sparing is limiting the self and view of others. Appropriation is finding common ground with others. And then formation is using our gifts or our resources to impact positively or to positively impact other people. All right, so let's talk about these three things uh, in a little more detail. So first of all, let's talk about sparing. All right, what does it mean to uh, spare oneself, to humble oneself? Well, this goes back to the very foundational doctrine and biblical idea that we are all, everyone, every single person who's ever been created, who's ever lived, who's ever been on this planet, every single person is created in the image of God. Now, that has very uh, important, long-lasting implications. And I put the word on the outline there. Therefore, dot, dot, dot. Because everybody is created in the image of God, that means everyone is due respect, honor, even if they treat us like, you know what, you know, we, we've got to be uh, aware of the fact that people make their own choices, all right? And, and sometimes we make very, very poor choices and there's conflict and there's drama in relationship, but everyone is created in the image of God and therefore is due respect. Therefore, in the interest of other people, we as Christians, right, we're not aggressive um, towards other people in asserting our own will, all right? We, we recognize that everyone has free will, and so we go about our lives in a non-aggressive, non-coercive manner, right? Sometimes we have to hold our boundaries, correct, right? We have to assert ourselves because we too are created in the image of God. However, we're, we're humble about this. Sometimes we withhold action in the interest of another person. Let me give you a quick illustration about what this means. This is a very simplistic, simple illustration, um, but you can, you can take the implications of it. So let's say it's uh, Thanksgiving, right? And the last piece of grandma's pumpkin pie is on the table, right? There's one piece left, but there's two people who want that piece of pie, right? You and uh, Cousin Eddie, right? He, he wants that piece of pie and you want it too. So, and you arrive at the table at the same time. Well, what are we going to do as believers in Jesus Christ? in a non-aggressive, non-coercive way, right? We can negotiate over that piece of pie, we can split it in two, or we can say, hey, Cousin Eddie, I don't need that, and uh, I already had a piece, and, you know, have, have at it, man, enjoy it, it's yours. I'm not going to argue about it, I'm not going to take you to court over this, this is not something to argue about, we're just, we're going to enjoy our time together, and hey, it's just a piece of pie, right? So it's limiting or withholding action in the interest of others. Um, another simple illustration. Here in Austin, the traffic is horrible, right? And we've all had experiences on the uh, various roadways in and around Austin, Texas, where uh, it's very hard to withhold action in the interest of others, especially when somebody else cuts us off or does something offensive to us on the roadway. But what does it mean for a Christian, even when we're driving down 35, right, or 290 or whatever it is, what does it mean to spare, to withhold action in the interest of another, all right? Recognizing that everyone, even that person who just cut you off and gave you an offensive gesture on the highway, even he or she is created in the image of God. So therefore, we're going to act in a non-aggressive, non-coercive way. That's sparing. 
Now let's talk a little bit about appropriation. You've probably heard this term before. Uh, sometimes today it's, it's um, used in a very negative sense. Uh, you may have heard the term cultural appropriation. Uh, that's when someone uh, rather offensively tries to, to take on to themselves characteristics of another culture or another race, and sometimes that can be very, very off-putting, uh, but that's not the kind of appropriation we're talking about. Uh, you know, people who have uh, in recent years gotten in trouble for putting on blackface, that kind of, that's cultural appropriation. That is nowhere near uh, what we're talking about here. When we use the term appropriation, we're acknowledging that in relationship to another person, that person is to be seen as an actual person, not as someone to be used, right? Um, so in relationship to another person, we're, we're not coming into that friendship or that relationship trying to see, hey, how can I manipulate things to get my way? How can I go about things to make sure that this person does exactly what I want them to do. Um, so quick example, let's go back to the pumpkin pie illustration. So uh, let's say you want that piece of pie. And so you, in your relationship with Cousin Eddie or whoever it is, um, you begin to think in your mind of ways that you could manipulate Cousin Eddie to not get around the table. Right. So let's see. Let's see if I can coerce him to get over to the side of the room and get him preoccupied with something so I can go sneak over and get the piece of pie. Right. That that's not appropriation. That's using somebody. All right. And, and we see in the scripture many examples of when people did this badly and when they did it very well. Jesus, of course, always did this very, very well. No one in his sphere of influence. Um, he, he never saw anyone as someone to be used for the furthering of, uh, you know, his brand or to climb the social ladder or something like that. Also in appropriation, we acknowledge the history, the story, or the cultural context that another person is coming from. Uh, in other words, we're not expecting people in our Christian way of doing things, we're not expecting people to become just like us, right? We see this actually play out so well in the New Testament, especially in the book of Acts, when there was a huge controversy about, um, are we going to let Gentiles be a part of this whole Christian movement without going through a bunch of uh, ritualistic, legalistic um, Old Testament legalistic mumbo jumbo, right? And and they came to the conclusion that, you know what? It, it, these people who are Gentiles are created in the image of God and they have just as much a right to the gospel as we do with having, without having to jump through a bunch of hoops, right? We see this a lot in the book of Acts talked about and then especially in Paul's letters where he makes case after case after case um, about how to engage with people who are much different than we are. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, other people are always right or that we're always right about things. It just means that we acknowledge that uh, people who are sort of outside of our story, our history, our culture uh, may not understand things uh, like we do, and so we take the gospel to them in ways that they can hear and understand and ways that we create um, that, uh, that relationship uh, based on a, a more mutual kind of understanding. And also, appro appropriation, this is the third thing, takes time through much learning and communication. Appropriation takes time, right? Relationship development takes a long time. And let me give you an example of what this looks like. I've been a part of churches before that um, do something really well when it comes to appropriation of the Christian life for the gospel. And that thing is that 
over years, uh, we're talking years, sometimes 30, 40 years, some of these churches have built relationships with different people in even different countries across the world, but it's taken sometimes 30, 40 years to build that relationship to get it to such a strong point that the church and the people in that different cultural context come together in ways that would never have been accomplished if that church just you know went on a mission trip for two weeks in the summertime to this group of people in you know Brazil and nothing really come came of that I mean there 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 was some good things that happened for two weeks but man you want to talk about good work uh, think about a relationship investment of 30 40 years compared to 14 days right appropriation takes time it takes time to learn about one another and communicate learn how to communicate well in terms of the gospel all right so that's appropriation very uh, appropriation is always appropriate we could say that about the christian life we're not using other people or coercing other people we are coming in relationship with others because everyone is made in the image of god okay and finally let's talk a little bit about formation this and this is an encouraging thing this is a really fun thing uh, to talk about we see all throughout the scripture even starting in genesis that god has given human beings each of us personally and individually as well as communally god has given us all an opportunity basically to put our stamp on something to to leave a legacy um not for ourselves right but for his glory in fact way back in genesis 2 one of the first commands that god gave to uh, male and female adam and eve he said cultivate the garden now th this is not god saying you will be my slaves or get down there and work that ground um, until i tell you to stop no it, it, it's nothing like that god is not like that uh, the the command cultivate the ground meant Put your stamp on something, invest yourself in something called work, and it's going to be a blessing. This is going to be satisfying, not only to us as human beings, but also we're going to do this to glorify God. Uh, we're going to be stewards of what God has given us. We're going to be ambassadors for God here on this earth. So we were created with this motivation deep down inside of us to put our stamp on something but not for us we're, we're not created to have our name in lines we're, we're created to uh, be a blessing and to give blessings to other people as ambassadors for Christ now how do we do that well a few questions for us here how can or how may you form natural resources through your labor and what I call recreation, not recreation, but recreation. In other words, uh, as God has given you different talents, we're all unique, right? We all have different talents and different um, ways that we think and do things, right? How do you use those resources that God has given you to bless others? And also to, to use in different ways, right, that can recreate something. For instance, let me make that less nebulous. Let's talk about something, again, very, very simple. There's something I use every day. It's called a pencil. <laughs> and if you think about that, where does a pencil come from? Well, from wood. And um, there's the little lead tips or graphite that's used now where does that come from well natural resources like trees right is it just a writing utensil but it's a product of recreation that is very very useful for the glory of god for the accomplishment of labor uh for just writing down notes to remember something which i need a lot of help on right so that's very helpful Who, whoever came up with a pencil god bless you uh, you formed something very well and put your stamp on it, right? That's what we're talking about. 
Also, another question is, how may you form the spiritual resources you have? Now, not just natural resources, but spiritual resources that God has given us that we can cultivate through rest or through slowing down. God gave such a great gift to his people back in um, as, as far back as Genesis as well. This idea of what is called a Sabbath rest or every uh, seventh day taking some time to just say, man, I'm going to not be in my rigorous routine. I'm going to turn off my devices. I'm going to concentrate on the Lord. I'm going to worship him. This is the Lord's day. It, taking some time to cultivate and re-energize the spirit through rest, through prayer, through taking loving action to one another. And then finally, another question, are my formative actions focused on God's glory and not on temporary utility for me? In other words, am I, is what I am doing, am I trying to bring glory to myself? Am I trying to use my resources as a utility, a tool for my own happiness? Or am I using what God has given me, my talents, my resources, to multiply for his glory and not for mine? That's formation. All right, so y'all, that's the second uh, of three triads. Now we're gonna get to the third one next uh, in the next video. All right, but we're talking about these very practical ways again, of walking as Jesus walked. We have the goal, we have the um, uh, we have duties, we have virtues, and now we've talked about sparing, appropriation, and formation. Just very practical ways of thinking about how we walk as Jesus walked and keep this structure fortified um, and keep the walls from being torn apart by all these different messy speculative philosophies that can that can really bring us down. So I hope this is fortifying your structure as uh, you continue to walk also as Jesus walked. Now, next time we'll get to another triad as we begin to round out this series of videos called Discipleship 301. Until next time then, I hope you have a, a, a great rest of your day or week or whenever you're watching this video, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye, everybody.